you can control the potential or the current and learn about ion electron coupled charge transfer across designed interfaces. And to this day, I've used much of what I've learned to leverage how to develop new tools, new analytical electrochemical tools to study very complex materials interfaces related with energy storage and conversion. Today, I will focus on the energy storage part of this because of the very big emerging need. Okay, now we know about renewable energy and the, and the need to diversify our energy infrastructure, namely that we can't just have the economy based on oil. We know that the current price of oil is very low right now, right? It's creating a challenge economically because if the whole economic system is, is built on income generated from oil, um, it, it provides a very weak infrastructure for diversification. So many uh, governments and many uh, countries around the world have decided that we should try to look at alternative forms of supplying energy, and we have many options. But of course, even collectively, if you look at the heart of the problem of going to renewable alternative energy sources, they all uh, have to be used in a mix of applications. Not one application, solar or wind, geothermal biomass, will solve uh, this renewable energy problem to diversify. In particular, we, we know the limitations about the wind blowing only at certain times of the day, same as the sun only shines at certain times of the day. Geothermal is geographically uh, I isolated or located, and the same with where you have the land availability, uh, availability to grow bi biomass and refine biomass into useful chemical fuel fuels. So herein lies the problem if you want to adopt this energy source to be able to provide humanity with a better way of living. And it has a lot to do with just the, the energy generation, regulation, distribution, and storage related to diversified energy networks. And so people, especially in the US who have looked at this problem, know about this, the level of system demand given on the certain time period of, of the day. So for instance, you can see the running axis of the amount of baseload generation when people are sleeping, then they wake up and they start to, to use electronic devices like microwave ovens and coffee pots. And there's a huge uptick in the amount of energy that's required to power those devices. And then of course, when people come home at night, they turn on the air conditioners and television sets and stereo systems, which require even more energy input. And that leads to some peak pro problem where we can't maybe necessarily generate enough energy to supply the demand. So what we essentially need to do is chop this off and make it level so that we can use storage to deliver the energy when it's needed and decouple the generation and distribution from the storage networks, or at least integrate them so you can be this in a more efficient manner. And so when people have looked at this, what type of storage options do we have available? There are many options and many options, not just in terms of so-called electrochemical energy storage type devices, but mechanical energy storage, pumped hydro, flywheels. Uh, these, are, these are things that, that convert uh, hydro energy, for instance, by a turbine from mechanical actuation or from the storage of, of, in, of high stress strain into this kind of flywheel architecture. These, these have some limitability in terms of very fast power requirements. This is related to the, the time scale of, of energy delivery seconds in this area. But in other cases, you want to store this area for this energy for a long period of time. And so you want to be able to use other forms. Metal air ba batteries are in general considered the long for long-term energy storage applications, one of the most promising because they are by far the most energy dense by weight. Of course, there's a lot of challenges associated with coupling air with a reactive metal, such as a lithium air battery, because of the fact that lithium metal is uh, thermodynamically unstable in the presence of air. But yet, if you wanted to build the most energy dense storage system, you would use the lightest elements possible. And that's why this ranks up above here in terms of this thing. Now we have well-known lead acid battery technology, but of course there's very various arguments as to why this can't continue. One is the recyclability of lead acid is very problematic. And also the use of lead as a toxic element to, to the environment. Um, there's other things problematic with lead acid battery that relatively speaking, the, 
the energy density is not as high as you'd like it. Now, um, we've had earlier versions of, of rechargeable systems, primarily NICAD and nickel metal hydride. Nickel NICAD batteries were used in portable electronics like cordless cell phones. Now they're no longer used because of various problems with the with the lifetime and the stability of the of the battery, it also uses other toxic elements such as cattle, uh, cadmium. So what I'm showing here is that now people really started to invest in development of lithium ion battery technologies because it kind of plays an intermediary role between increasing the energy density to quite high, where you can power grid level type storage options, but it, it allows you to deliver energy relatively in a short time frames. And this could be useful for other types of how we regulate the distribution of energy, which I don't have time to go into. Other forms like large scale things that they have to do with things like pumped hydro, which I also won't go into. Okay, so let's focus on um, uh, lithium ion batteries with regards uh, to storage. Uh, because there was a, a big effort in the, in the US, it was uh, Department of Energy formed uh, uh, a big joint proposal, it was a big proposal, $300 million to fund an energy storage hub based at Argonne National Laboratories in partnership with several uh, flagship universities in the US. And they did some analysis about what would be the current state of art of where we are with regards to the development of reversible chargeable secondary batteries such as lithium ion, lead acid, NICAD. And this is where we are currently. By looking at some of the other parameters that go into what governs the practical energy density and the theoretical energy density, the practical energy density takes into account cost of materials and recyclability and product life cycle type arguments. That then if you wanted to really push this up to where the batteries need to be, they identified some of these more interesting sets of re reversible systems. Although you might say that we haven't really been able to bring this to full reality, but they do represent the highest practical energy density systems with the highest theoretical proposed energy density. So if we could walk up this line and become more like gasoline, then there's, some, there's a lots of advantages in terms of why you would want to adopt this on a large scale, especially for grid and transportation based uh, systems. Okay, if you compare that to energy storage for humans, we rank way down here. We're not very practical in our energy density and we're not very practical theoretically. And this has to do with an with argument that I made to undergraduates about the matrix where they wanted to learn about, you remember the matrix was powered by humans. And I made the argument that if by feeding the humans to power the matrix, it would be uh, prohibitive based on, on the fact that they consume more than they, they can generate. Okay, then if you look at the current kind of state of where we are, this data is a little bit old, but you have essentially well-known Tesla uh, cars that are becoming very pro productive and, and many of them are being produced. And currently the drive range is, is a little bit greater than this now, the current thing. But really what's important is the price per mile of vehicle range. So both the cost to be able to give that, that range, but also the, the size of the power pack that goes into this battery has some constraints with regards to how much energy it takes to move a large mass, right? So th these are extremely heavy batteries. They're not light. They're about one third the vehicle weight of the car and one third the size of the car. And this is then the key problem for wanting to drop to adopt all electric vehicles. I'm not talking about hybrids, which are not shown on this list. But this, this list now is, is actually many of these um, companies like VW and BMW and Porsche, they're moving quite up the, up the list here because they were able to really develop over the last five years quite dramatically some key battery technology. Again, I won't, I won't highlight that because this is not the purpose of this talk. I'm supposed to talk about materials. So herein lies the challenge, is that uh, you have a trade-off between the specific power of your battery and the specific energy. And so we have different forms of electrochemical energy storage. Here's non-rechargeable primary batteries. These are lithium metal batteries that people really don't use anymore. Um, but then if you want to make reversible secondary batteries like lithium ion, the current state of the art is really that we can be fairly energy dense, but the power characteristics are not very good for transportation. This is equivalent to 
pushing on the accelerator to go up a hill in a car. And maybe those of you that have driven in say a Prius, which is a hybrid, it's, it's got a metal hydride battery with a gasoline engine. The, the power of this is, is really limiting. It, it's slow to go up a hill. It can't deliver energy on demand. And the other form of, of energy storage has to do with uh, non faradaic type processes. They're known as electrochemical double layer capacitors. And these are very good at storing energy very quickly, but they're inherently very low in their energy density. And so you can't really use them as a primary uh, power source. You have to use the capacitors in concert with re reversible systems like methyl, little lithium metal ion to be able to provi provide uh, impact into the, the transportation industry as, as we electrify our, our, our transportation sector. Now, we asked a lot of fundamental questions about what are the limits with regards to this, because several years ago, we had lots of money also from the Department of Energy to form a frontier research center that allowed us to focus on key problems with regards of how we can move the lithium ion to higher power uh, characteristics. So this was a very nice group of people that were trying to look at all of the available uh, constraints with regards to how we improve the performance for particular applications, regardless, in, in particular transportation and grid scale. So here down below is listed some of the more commercialized materials that you might have heard about, lithium cobalt oxide being the first one commercialized in 1990 with the discovery by John Goodenough, Nobel Prize winner uh, of 2019. And then there's the nickel uh, manganese spinel, the olivine lithium iron phosphates, and also um, more complex so-called excess uh, um, uh, lithium materials or, or um, uh, CMP, so cobalt man manganese nickel oxides uh, relative to lithium sulfur. And you can see that in terms of some of the per performances for either cathode materials, and then there's also listed here for what you choose as the cathode or the anode, excuse me, that, that there's, there's trade-offs, not, not one material solves all of the particular problems. So how do we actually improve, regardless of the material choice, all of the design characteristics that need to be met in order to actually bring, in particular, the cost of the storage and the, and the lifetime of the storage pack, battery pack to the right constraints. And so the DOE knows, for instance, where the breaking point is, is that we want to drive the cost of the battery pack below $100 per kilowatt hour. And we want to have the lifetime of the battery last for up to 10 years, because that's the, the average lifetime that most people own a vehicle, okay? For grid scale, the, the, the lifetime is more like 15 years, but the cost for kilowatt per hour is roughly about the same. So this gives us some design parameters at which we want to benchmark against to show if we've created new materials, can we really meet these, these demanding targets? And so one of the efforts that's going on, especially at Skoltech, in, in conjunction with Moscow State University, because I moved to Russia in 2014 to form the Center for Electrochemical Energy Storage. And there was a very specific set of, of goals that we wanted to, to accomplish, was to actually namely raise the operation voltage of the, of the cathode, because this is where you get gains both in power and energy. And, and so there was a, a set of nice reviews quite some time ago that said, if you want to double the energy density and, and raise the operating voltage of the cathode, you should look at substituting more electronegative elements like oxygen and fluorine and phosphorus, so-called um, uh, uh, fluorophosphate type materials. There's of course some other ones, but they're, they're less promising because of the redox the stability of the transition metal that provides the redox potential is very problematic. But we focused on, on the design of these types of materials in addition to improving synthetic parameters to make uh, very pure, uh, very well-performing uh, olivines, namely lithium iron phosphate and doped lithium iron phosphate materials. And now we've also started efforts with this so-called NMC type material because it also has quite high capacity relative to the conventional uh, materials that we have already commercialized, such as spinel and lithium cobalt oxide, which is not shown here. So um, at Skoltech, we now can make at kilogram scale, 
um, these olivines. And one of the purposes of, of lith lithium um, iron phosphate is it's very good at power characteristics. Even though the energy density is somewhat low relative to, to say, uh, the NMC materials or, or the spinels. But the nice thing about this is that if you put in substitute in manganese, you can start to increase the energy density. And this uh, provides, again, another design parameter uh, and also raise the operational uh, voltage of the cathode. Uh, we also have several uh, aspects with regards to other type of uh, more exotic materials for beyond lithium, things like sodium batteries and potassium batteries, which I also won't talk about in the focus of this talk. But these kind of key people here are the ones um, that are really trying to move forward commercial scale production of high purity cathode materials to, to help Russia diversify their energy storage um, uh, industry. So we've made some tremendous progress in the last five years, um, but I won't brag about that. I'll talk more about some of the current challenges still in trying to understand what governs uh, the needs. So I said that if we actually raise the voltage of the cathode, so here shows a nice review by John Goodenough, uh, one of my formal colleagues, where he had this very nice review that said, okay, the current state of the art is using carbonate electrolytes with one molar lithium fluorophosphate as the lithium ion carrier. And if you then look at the different commercialized materials, where does the voltage of the cathode lie relative to the voltage of the anode? And so the key operating voltage of the battery is the difference between the, the electrochemical potential of the anode relative to the cathode. And that defines essentially the electrochemical window of stability, which is related to the stability of the carbonate electrolyte and the salt, because as you raise the cathode potential, you start to become very oxidizing. And you might know already that nickel four oxidation state, nickel very four is a very oxidizing metal or cobalt four, right? And so those types of cathodes that contain those transition metals, they start to react irreversibly with the solvent once you, once you make the battery. But of course we can stabilize these interfaces if we don't go to quite high potential and commercialize materials such as these two options, which you can now buy batteries made with that particular cathode material. The other thing to notice is that we currently use a graphitic anode in most of all commercial batteries. And this lies below the window of electrochemical stability. And it's unique to the actually properties of graphite, which is that when lithium ions interact with, with graphite, they never re get reduced to lithium metal. They insert as ions in between the van der Waals spaces of this graphitic structure. At the same time, there's preferential reduction of the carbonate electrolyte that provides a self-passivating la layer that self-limits based on this kind of measured potential versus capacity. And this allows a, a very protective barrier to promote ion transfer, but block electron transfer, uh, le essentially the, the ability to form dendrites in the battery, but to also operate at a very low potential where you can recharge and discharge the system several times without losing uh, lithium that gets trapped in this layer. If this layer continues to grow, basically you deplete the, the, the lithium ions in the electrolyte and you have no longer can cycle this because the resistance of the electrolyte is, 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 is self-limiting. So again, the key design parameters are to raise the energy and to raise the power. And the best way to do that is to raise the voltage of the cathode and perhaps find other suitable forms of carbon or even high energy density alloying effects like tin or silicon, which you also might already know about that um, are, have other problematic processes. Okay, so we sought to tackle this problem in a more systematic way. And importantly, we wanted to use several different experimental tools to get a handle on both structural changes, but also compositional changes as you operate these, these cathode and anode materials in the electrolyte of, of, of relevance to the battery. And so one of the things we started to do is design experiments where we could look at polycrystalline materials that were known to be pretty good at reversible lithium ion insertion, but were problematic with regards to the volume expansion, right? And so one prototypical material is something like molybdenum oxide. 
And we could make this material in several different forms and use vibrational spectroscopy to identify different polymorphs within a polycrystalline architecture. And I'll, I'll just show you a movie about how you can um, use optical methods to understand how they work as electrochemical uh, cathodes. Um, so we, we can throw essentially the whole analytical toolbox at this problem to really understand how we can assess all of the key parameters at which you'd like to, to control to optimize the material system. Okay, so I will now have to exit out of this thing because I want to show you a movie and I'm not, I don't want to go into too much detail, but what I want you to do is just see the visualization that when you insert lithium ions into molybdenum oxide, followed by this reaction up here, what happens in terms of starting out in a more crystalline state to one that looks more disordered, right? And then also how the crystallites actually swell, they expand in volume. So let me see if I can, I can get this to work. It's always, it's very difficult to embed movies, but so this is a, a different type of file. Um, let me rewind this. Okay, so to explain this, what we have shown here is a polycrystalline electrode, rough, roughly about 50 microns in size. And this is an optical microscopy image. So it's optically transparent. If we were to look at it by your eye, it would look slightly yellowish. And then what we're gonna plot is the, uh, as we apply a potential to insert lithium ions into molybdenum oxide, we reduce molybdenum six to molybdenum five, and by charge compensation, this leads to the insertion of lithium into molybdenum oxide. And so we can record the overall cyclic voltammogram, but then we can also use optical techniques to provide regions of interest where we know the chemical or the structural identity of one of the polymorphs that make up this polycrystalline electrode. So it's color coded in a beta phase, uh, an, uh, 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 so-called um, alpha phase. And then there's, there's phases that are too small to really pick out based on um, X-ray diffraction or Raman to, to really know if there's mixtures of the two components. So I'm gonna play this movie. And in these regions, what we're doing is because when lithium inserts into molybdenum and you reduce it from molybdenum six to five, there's also a, a near infrared absorbance that changes the color. So it becomes electrochromic and those with the most lithium turn blue to the eye. So what we're here is recording the grayscale change in the optical density that is provided by um, so-called metrology, where we can provide histograms through the imaging as a function of time and extract by integration in those areas, the concentration of lithium that is spatially in inserted into those regions. So it's, it's, a, it's actually a quantifiable, quantified technique. But again, I just wanna show you the visible changes of how complex when you stick lithium into this material, how, many, how much things change. So right at the onset, you can see this large peak and all of a sudden a kind of a sponge like swelling. And then as you start to put in with more and more negative reducing potential, you start to see that there's these other transitions that occur that are associated with the beta phase and other uh, mixed phases. And then to extract lithium, what you see is it starts to bleach, it starts to become more optically transparent, but the pristine state of that material has been essentially degraded. It looks more disordered than when you start. So this allows us, for instance, to, to deconvolute where these different peaks occur and what particular phase of the material they're related to, to optimize the material composition for polycrystalline materials. But it also allows us to extract things like the diffusion coefficient in a spatially resolved way to learn about how to suppress uh, other, other aspects with regards to the mobility of ions within this assertion host, or uh, why, for instance, we need the beta phase co-localized with the alpha phase. So again, I just want you to get a sense that how complex the volume and the, the compositional changes occur as a function of the potential. So we, we, we want to be able to interpret this so we developed these kind of spatially resolved images to understand for polycrystalline materials, what governs um, these different potential dependent processes. And that gets um, uh, again to this kind of more systematic approach. And so, uh, sorry, I have to move the cursor here. And so um, what we did is we started to do a series of, of different compositional 
and size dependent, morphologically dependent syntheses where we could, for instance, make different sized uh, lithium iron phosphate and then use vibrational spectroscopy in the form of a coin cell. So it's simulating the battery environment by drilling a small little optical window and then follow the vibrational spectra to report on the state of charge and discharge of this, of this olivine material. And it turns out that it's a very interesting material because you, in order to make it operate, it has to be nano-sized and it has to be coated with a surface layer of carbon to stabilize this, this, uh, this uh, reactive interface. So again, what we're trying to ask is what can governs basically the power and the, and the energy density and morphology components of these energy storage materials. The reason why, we, why we, this was um, as a focus of nano-sizing is that we could also couple this to state-of-the-art theory to understand what would be kind of the limitations to ions moving into the crystal structure. Is it surface diffusion? Is it diffusion in channels? Are there other diffusive pathways where they can go around defects, for instance? Um, and this allows us then to help understand when we do these kind of in situ vibrational experiments. And in fact, we found that for the case of lithium iron phosphates, you can form anti-site defects, which means that when iron substitutes in for lithium, it blocks the channel for diffusion. But in some cases, lithium ions can diffuse around by some exchange mechanism, concerted mechanism, where it's actually quite lower barrier and it doesn't really block the diffusion into another channel. So this um, was just a prediction by theory, but we thought we would again use vibrational spectroscopy where we could record different vibrational um, bonds associated with where the lithium sits in the matrix. So if those of you that might know vibrational spectroscopy, infrared and Raman are very sensitive forms of the types of interactions in the crystal structure. So there's these different types of stretching frequencies that are related to the, the phosphate. But in the low frequency regime, there's these modes known as lattice or photon vibra vibrational modes. And this is actually where lithium, when it coordinates, is most sensitive. You can see that down here in these, these, these so-called uh, longitudinal transverse modes or external modes, that when you start to put lithium in, in lithium iron phosphate, you suppress those interactions. And this actually can be used to monitor the state of charge of the battery. So what we did is we used different sized particles and we charged them up, i.e. delithiated the, the, the lithium from the iron phosphate. And then we short circuited the coin cell and watched these bands disappear. And what this is measuring is a size dependent spontaneous lithiation of the, of the charged uh, iron phosphate. And the consequence of these studies showed uh, in particular that when you use nano sized materials, they're not stable because they're all surface. And so if you want to make a battery, what you want to use is bigger sized materials because when you charge them and st store them on the shelf, they'll be more stable than if you use um, small particles because they will, the battery, its potential will spontaneously discharge. And that might seem obvious to some battery engineers, but maybe not to some, a lot of people that study nano size effects in, in nanomaterials, and especially for, with regards to the claims that nano is better for, for energy storage. In several respects, it's not always better. It can be better in some contexts, but not always. So another prototypical system is the fact that we're using earth abundant materials and many people have known that we can, if we get a, rid of the carbon, we can actually, by raising the potential above the window of stability, we can enhance um, the power density of the device because titania oxides, when they lithiate, there's very little volume change. And so we wanted to think, well, how do size effects and morphology effects and poly uh, crystalline or polymorph effects affect the energy storage density for a range of different type mates. The other thing is, is that there's a lot of synthetic methods that allow you to do nano architectural control, making nano rods, nano sheets, nano plates, right? And this just shows you that if you look at the size effect for these different polymorphs of, of, uh, of type mates, regardless of the polymorph, when you make them nano sized, the amount of lithium ions per titanium site increases quite considerably. And this has to do with the fact that the phase diagram for lithiated titanates changes 
compared to the bulk phase diagram, right? And that's not always obvious to some, some people that study the bulk properties of materials versus people that study nanos nanoscopic materials. So you have a way of actually accessing kinetically stable materials that you were, were, were essentially not thermodynamically stable in the bulk. And so we started to look at this very interesting new, new material, the most newest form, which is this TiO2 beef or bronze phase. And this actually was, just, was reported very early on by, by Gretzel, which maybe he'll, he'll mention or talk about, but they were trying to make annotase, nanocrystalline annotase, and they found that by certain hydrothermal type syntheses using um, polymer templates, that they could stabilize this, this so-called titanium B phase. I'll come back to, to this. The other problem is, is that when you, when you change the size of the material, the actual charge storage process changes. And this can be uh, measured and evidenced by the type of experiment that you do. So maybe some of you know that if you cycle linearly and ramp the potential and measure the current versus potential, if it's a capacitor, it will have a, a certain shape, basically a capacitive envelope where there's no peaks that appear. And if you have a, a Faradaic process that's controlled by diffusion, what you'll get is this kind of peak-shaped response where there's peak splitting between, say, the reduction and the oxidation process or the insertion of lithium and the deinsertion of lithium. Now, there are some materials that have behavior when they're confined primarily to the surface where they have characteristics of both of these processes. And this is um, also evidenced in so-called galvanostatic discharge curves, which the battery people like to use as a way to measure the charge and discharge characteristics of the battery and estimate the, the capacity. Now, this, this value capacity is just the number of coulomb, coulombs stored. It's the charge stored per kilogram of material. Whereas here, this is the voltage. But if you take the derivative of this with respect to the voltage, you can get something that looks like a, a incremental uh, capacity curve or something equivalent to the cyclic voltammetry experiment. So we started to look at this material, TO2B, for the main reason that if you confine it, um, what you have is more sites for lithium to sit, three different sites, and the overall density, energy density is about 1.25 lithiums per titanium, which is the highest titanate um, energy density for, for th this particular uh, series or families. And so uh, theory actually could calculate the energy of these different sites to predict when you stick lithium in here, where, where, where the lithium will coordinate. And of course, because there's three different energetic sites, you should expect more than one particular uh, site filling as a function of the, the, of the potential, or i.e. a more complicated cyclic potamogram. Now, we also developed a synthetic method that allowed us to conform the, the morphology to make nano sheets, which are platelets. These are two-dimensional type materials where you have a very thin cross-section, only a few nanometers thick, but you have essentially a very open surface. And so in this case, there's really no diffusional channel for which lithium to move into. So this essentially should not be limited by how fast lithium can move into this nano-confined nano uh, two-dimensional sheet. Now, um, if you try to look at these by high-resolution microscopy, what you find is that if you treat them in some way by adding, for instance, a solvent, these little sheets like to roll up like crumpled paper. And th that problem is, is that then to characterize them, you don't really see what, what you think you see if they're suspended in solution versus say confined on the electrode surface. But this just shows you that in fact, yes, we have this kind of nanosheet structure and that the nanosheets range in size to roughly a certain number, several hundreds of nanometers, and that you get buckling and stacking when you try to process them. Okay, so how does lithium insert into this material? And so we compared the nanosheet morphology to the nanoparticle, because they're roughly, we can make nanoparticles of roughly the same size and control the, the morphology. And, and so quite easily you can see that when you measure the charge and, and, and discharge, the discharge and the charge characteristics, very little differences can be seen by eye. But if you take that re, the derivative of the capacity relative to the, the potential, what you get is equivalent to a cyclic voltammogram. And clearly with the nanoparticle, you can start to see that there's these little different peaks, 
associated with lithium going into different sites, A sites, B sites in particular, whereas in the nanosheet, you see this very broad envelope, a much larger capacitive envelope and a more, a more convoluted distribution of, 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 of a set of peaks. Now this suggested quite strongly that you have a, a morphology dependent uh, lithium charge storage mechanism that changes as a function of morphology. And so with modeling, we were able to show how the potential dependent site filling, so it's labeled here as the color coded sites, the C site, the A site, A1 and A2. And when you use nanoparticles, the site filling order is different, a potential dependence than it is when you use these nano sheets. The nano sheets are in some sense strained and the channel uh, uh, is more open. So it allows easier coordination with the C site. So at very low potentials, lithium inserts first in the C site, and then you see this kind of potential dependent staging of lithium to fully lithiate the whole material. But because it's all surface, it looks much more like a capacitive response than it does where there's peak splitting between the forward reaction and the backward reaction, basically the, the extraction of lithium and the insertion of lithium. Okay, that hysteresis has to do with the fact that the lithium ions sitting in the lattice see each other, that there's columbic repulsions. So in one site, you see that there's, there's a titanium site, that then there's another titanium site. And at low concentration, there's less columbic um, uh, interactions so that hysteresis for insertion of lithium and the extraction, that peak splitting has to do with the extra energy required to extract lithium as a function of the number of sites filled versus the number of sites that um, are energetically interacting. And this is why we see a change in the morphology and the influence of which sites fill with lithium under different potential dependence. And this was one of the very first studies that showed such a, such a large effect for similar sizes of material. The other thing that we wanted to point out is that um, Gretzel, again, this is a paper by Gretzel in 2000, where they were making mesoporous annotase for making disynthesized solar cells. And they found some very interesting characteristics when they used lithium as an electrolyte to just measure the, the properties of annotase. So this is showing this cyclic voltammogram where they're inserting lithium in propylene carbonate as a function of lithium uh, metal. And you, so they started to notice these peaks at this more lower potential than where they would expect to see it for annotase. And depending on the processing conditions, they argued that what was happening is that they were forming amorphous uh, uh, TiO2 within this little crystalline, nanocrystalline annotase matrix that was templated by the use of a block copolymer, right? And then later on, Peter Bruce, another well-known uh, battery expert, they, they claimed by using theory uh, that this TO2B nano was very good battery material. And then they, then they tried to use, uh, I would say, not a quite adequate level of theory and claimed again that, that in this TO2B, the, the first site that filled was the C site and then A1 and A2. But it, we now know that this peak right here, at, because of its potential, is really the annotase impurity because when they heat this material up, it undergoes a phase transition to form nanocrystalline annotase from the original synthesis of the TiO2B. And so we, we showed this quite dramatically that when you use Raman spectroscopy, you can actually measure through the vibrational spectroscopy, not only the phase of the material, but also the morphology of the material. So when you have TiO2B, you can see that at the low frequency range, there's a very discrete set of peaks. If you make a nanoparticle, these peaks mix with each other, but if you have a nano sheet, these modes die out. Uh, that is in contrast that if you have annotase present, you have this one primarily vibrational low frequency mode that uniquely identifies annotase. And then of course, rutile is another higher temperature for thermodynamic storm of st form of this that also has a very characteristic Raman signature. So what that allowed us to do is to look at temperature dependent centering effects of how we nucleate annotase, therm more thermodynamically stable annotase crystals within the TO2B nanosheets. And so this diagnostic of using cyclic voltammetry 
tells you that when peaks start to grow in, this is starting to show the appearance as, 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 as of anatase. And in particular, the kind of scan rate dependence tells you that, that the mechanism is changing for storing ions in anatase versus TiO2B. And um, it gets more complicated than this, but what we could show is as we heat this material up, we could follow the degradation of the capping ligand that maintained the stability of the nanosheet. It starts to form graphitic carbon due to the degradation of the ethylene glycol that stabilizes the nanosheet morphology. And then we could actually see, as we heat this up to roughly about 400 degrees C, all of the TO2B converts to anatase. And that's, that's a nice thing to understand in terms of material processing characteristics, because if you want to really go to the best performing material, you can show, yes, nanostructuring can, uh, increases the energy density, the so-called capacity in this case. But if you make big, big particles, for instance, bulk, you can see that over time, the performance drops off quite dramatically. Whereas for nano um, or mesoporous nano-sized uh, annotase and TO2B, you get much higher capacity retention at much higher discharge and charge cycles. So this is equivalent to charging the battery within three minutes, right? And this just kind of uh, was plotted for different types of uh, parameters to, to optimize this. So the one design parameter that we learned from is that yes, mesoporosity is important and nano sizing effects is very important. As long as you provide the simple, the, the uh, templating rules to be able to make the right stable architecture. And this um, again goes back to the fact that Gretzel and others used block copolymer templates to make these very nice hierarchical structures where you have nano sized crystalline particles that center together, but then they orient themselves within this block copolymer template. And then you can remove the template and you can form these kind of hexagonal close pack pores. And that actually has been shown now several times over that this role, role of nano architecture, nano structuring, mesoporosity uh, principles leads to the highest performance in terms of gravimetric capacity as a function of the power characteristics of the device. And this um, then was just trying to show out of the literature if you use different sizes and shapes, what would lead to the overall highest performing material as an anode material. Um, but what we'd rather like to do rather than use um, empirical methods where we just systematically screen all of these different compositions, all these different sizes, all these different shapes, could we actually use computer, computers to computationally uh, design properties, but also predict their properties? This comes out of the, the materials genome, right? And in some sense, what's shown here is a whole range of different compositions that could be explored that are focused on more earth abundant types of, of, of elements, uh, minerals in this particular case. This was for anodes. Um, and so the idea here is the computers are much more uh, quick at, at, at predicting what we should look for rather than just measuring a bunch of properties and materials and showing and tabulating which one might be better. And so this is one of the other focuses of what we have at Skoltech is that we have many people working along the lines to use different levels of computational theory and modeling to be able to understand what materials might operate the best in terms of their performance. And so recently we've we started a lot of studies looking at, again, different lithium, potassium, and sodium materials to see where the voltage is of the cathode, what would be the most optimal structure, but also what would be the fastest transport properties, mobilities that are re related to the, the size of the activation barriers for them to hop from one site to another site within the crystal structure. This then allows us really to look more in a high throughput way and to optimize uh, predicted materials without having to go through a huge design space or phase space. And most recently, and this is where I'll end, is that several people in our center, in particular Stanislav Badotov, whom I'm sure many of you know, really thought about the problem and he's published several nice papers in this most recent one in um, Nature Communications, it's already on the, on the web, where he was able to predict a new form of titanium uh, phosphate that actually reversibly intercalates uh, lithium and other uh, at really high 
capacity. But the other interesting thing is by going to this fluoro, fluorine doping, so this is, a, this is a titanium fluorophosphate material, he is able to raise the uh, potential of this material to go beyond the potential of where most titanates sent. And that's because most um, titanium um, materials are better anodes than they are cathodes. It's because of the titanium plus two to plus three redox transformation. But if you start to put in more electronegative elements, you start to raise the average potential of the transition metal, titanium in this case, and access the titanium 3,4 oxidation state. And so what's shown in this energy diagram in the bottom is this idea, again, of substitution, um, compositional substitutional control by making uh, solid solutions with more electronegative elements to raise the voltage of the, of this case, the titanium redox couple to make it a more effective cathode than it is an anode. And then what, what's really impressive about this is that we could make a very high power, fast charging and discharging material with a very cheap material. It's titanium, uh, phosphorus and fluorine, all really pretty much earth abundant materials. And we could combine that again with another form of titanate to make roughly a very fast charging system with, with more than about a three volt operation, operating, maybe two and a half volt operational potential. So this is really the end of my lecture and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for listening. The summary slides, so if you wanna read them. Amazing. So this is uh, the small certificate for you, which I promise you to mail you after our self-isolation will be over. Uh, it's in, in hard copy with the signature of the academician Sonsov as a uh, small acknowledgement for your uh, lecture and dedication to our online lecture program. Thank you very much for doing this and uh, we invite you and uh, your colleagues your students, as well as all our um, uh, participants today to join other online lectures at uh, the Faculty of Material Science, Moscow State University, which will uh, be holded regularly. Next one will be this Friday. We will have the um, remote uh, connection with the Japan, with uh, the um, uh, Tsukuba Research Center, namely AIST institution, where our very good friend, uh, Ivan Turkevich will deliver the talk about uh, another aspects of storing the energy which is coming from the renewable sources. I hope it also will be very interesting for you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you for everybody for hearing, for listening to us and for asking the questions. You're welcome. Stay safe and you know where to find me if you want yes. to ask more questions. Thank you very much. Stay Bye. safe. Bye-bye.